Pastor Harold here from Abundant Life for Sife Church. Scriptures for you this morning. But the Word of God can do more than I could ever do. Amen. It's power in His Word. It's power in His Word. So today, if you are physically able, I'm going to ask you to stand for just a few more minutes as we read Matthew chapter 21. And then we'll pray and we're going to get into this message this morning that I believe God has orchestrated for each person that's here today. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Now I'm reading out the NLT version this morning. It says, uh, chapter 21, verse 1 says, As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethlehem of the Mount of Olives. And Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, uh, just say the Lord needs them and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, Look, your king is coming to you. He's humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him, and they threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread, spread them on the road. And Jesus was in the center of the procession, and all the people, uh, all the, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings of the, on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this? They asked. And the crowds replied, It's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Let's pray. Precious Lamb of God, Master, you're so worthy. Father, there's nothing that we could ever say or do to ever repay you back. But Lord, today we assemble together to worship you. This is the day, Lord, that you have made. And I will rejoice and be glad in it. It was because of your sacrifice, Father, sending your Son to die a sinner's death so that we wouldn't have to. I thank you for it. Master, today, I pray that you open the eyes and the hearts of every person in this room today. Every person that may be watching today, Father, I pray today that they would hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and not the voice of man. I pray today that you would anoint my lips to preach and teach your word and anoint the ears to hear it and the hearts to receive it. I pray today that life change for Jesus Christ would take place in this house and all across this land today, Father. I pray that there would be a great outpouring of your spirit today on your people, Lord. I pray for those that don't know you today, God, and they would come to know you by the end of this service. You paid the ultimate price. We thank you. Now, Father, do what only you can do today. Allow me to be a vessel. For truly I am here, Lord, willing to be used by you. So bind my tongue where it needs to be bound and loose it where it needs to be loosed. I cast down every stronghold right now, Father, and every hindrance that would try to take place in this house today. I pray today there would be nobody on the right or the left or front or behind them, oh God, that would hinder somebody from receiving the Word of God today. And I pray today, Lord, that it would not fall on deaf ears, but it would fall on fertile ground today, Lord, and the seed would take root and the harvest would come forth. I give you praise in advance. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that I ask these things today. Somebody shout amen. Amen. Look at somebody and tell them the king's coming today. Tell them the king's coming. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. How many of you know this morning when Jesus comes back again, he's going to be coming into power. Amen. He'll be coming in glory and power. And I'm telling you today, I'm excited that he's going to be coming that way. Oh, because he's a mighty king. Amen. He's a mighty king. But let me tell you a little story about a, a young boy that 
was going to go to church, and he woke up that morning and just didn't feel like going. Had an excuse not to go to church. So he didn't go to church, and, and that day at church, it was Palm Sunday, and they was waving the palm leaf branches and all this. And, and so he got back home, his dad and him got back home, and he said, what happened at church today, Dad? And he said, well, he said, we waved palm branches today in the service. And he said, well, why'd you wave palm branches in the service? He said, well, they did that when Jesus came into Jerusalem. No boy hung his head down. He said, oh, shucks. His dad said, what's wrong? He said, the one day I didn't go to church, Jesus showed up. We don't ever know when Jesus is coming back. But I'm telling you, he's coming back. Amen. The king is coming back. And it may not be right now, five minutes ago, but he could be coming back in the next 30 seconds. We don't know. But I do know he is coming back. And he's coming back for his bride. Amen. When Jesus came the first time, he rode in on, on the colt, the donkey's colt, and, and he comes the second time, he's riding a white horse. And we know the first time he came as a carpenter's son, he was humble in all his ways, but he comes the second time as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. <laughs> Beloved, I'm telling you, the first time he came, he stood before Pilate, but the second time he comes, Pilate will stand before him. And not only will he stand before him, but he'll kneel before him as well. There is a difference when Jesus comes back. It's not going to be like it was the first time. His second time will be different. He has come to fulfill prophecy. He will come in the glory. He will be known by everybody. When Jesus comes again, he will come with all the power and with all the authority. Revelation 19, 11 says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. On the first ride, Jesus came meek and humble on the colt of the donkey, but when he comes again, he comes in the power on a white horse, majestic, strong, and powerful. The first time he came on and ride and died as a sacrifice for our sins, but the second time he will come to judge. And declare war. Mm, I'm glad I'm in the Lord's army. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Revelation 19, 14 says, The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. When he rode the first time, he was followed by fishermen and misfits on foot. I'm telling you today, but when he comes again, he'll be followed by the armies of the living God. There will be a defined line between what was and what's going to be. The question is, what side of the line are you going to be on? When he came the first time, he said that my kingdom is not of this world. And when he comes again, he'll establish a kingdom on earth. This kingdom will have no end and no one will be able to come against it. See, he came the first time and fulfilled prophecy about the Messiah. But when he comes again, he'll fulfill it about a mighty warrior. When he came the first time, he said he would prepare us a home. But when he comes the second time, he's going to take us home. So I don't know about you this morning, but I'm ready for him to come and take me home. Because when he rode in the first time, he was followed by fishermen. But he's coming again. Followed by the Lord army. Jesus is coming again to fulfill what was written. You can be assured of it. He'll come in glory. Matthew 6, 9, they're shouting Hosanna to the son of David. So when Jesus rides into Jerusalem, he rides in in glory, but he comes in in a, a humble glory. Verse 7 says they brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw the garments over the colt and he sat on it. Watch this in 2 Kings uh, chapter 9, verses 12 and 13. It talks about how when Jehu was made king, they would take their clothes and they would throw it over the colt or the donkey and lay their, their, their garments on the ground. It was showing that a king was coming forth. The point is that Christ was now unmistakably claiming the dignity and the rights of a king. He was letting him know that I am the king of kings. He came in humble, but he came in as throwing him know that he is the king. He was not only shown glory by his disciples, though, but he was also shown glory by the multitude. Verse 8 says that most of this crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him. 
and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Look, this was a spontaneous celebration by the crowd. They honored Jesus by spreading their garments on the road. This is one of the few verses in Scripture that actually show that Jesus was glorified as a king on earth by a multitude. Notice that Matthew says it was a very great multitude. It was a large number of people gathered. The atmosphere that day had to be electric with the exciting news that Jesus was God's promised Messiah. They not only glorified him with their actions, but they glorified him with their voices. The multitudes who went before out cried out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They called him the son of David, which was the title of the Messiah. They shouted out, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. This means blessed is he who is sent by God to save his people. He was the Savior. The good thing is he still is. Blessed is he who is sent with the authority of God. When it became apparent that Jesus was not going to fulfill their hopes, though, we know that the crowd turned against them very quickly, didn't they? Another crowd would soon cry out, crucify him. When Jesus stood on trial only just a few days later, but, but God will return in glory. And when Jesus comes again, everything in this universe will be inadequate to what his glory is all about. Gold, silver, diamonds, pearl, jopaz, whatever it is, nothing will be able to, to stand up to his glory. He'll be magnificent. Luke 21, 27 says, At the time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with the power and great glory. The first time he was just a, a baby born in a manger to ordinary people just like us. Laid in a manger, but not the second time. The second time he will return, beloved. You got to understand something today. He didn't just come one time and say, well, I'll just let it play out. No, he has an appointed time. Now, we don't know that appointed time, but he knows it. He knows that appointed time. And he will come back in power, in glory. He will come back. I'm telling you today, the king is coming back. Somebody shout out, the king is coming back. I know we sit around sometimes and we think about that and we say, is he really coming back? He's coming back. I know when you, if you're like me, when you was a small child, you would hear preachers, oh, he's coming soon, he's coming soon. Well, soon in our time may not line up with his time. But he is coming back. You can bet on it. And when he comes back this time, everybody, somebody shout everybody, everybody. we'll know him. Everybody's going to know him. Matthew 10 and 11, it tells us that when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved. Now, the word move means to stir up, to be shaken to the core, to the very foundations. It's kind of like when the first man walked on, moon, on the moon. Now, I wasn't alive at that time. Some of you may have been in here. I don't know everybody's age, but, and I'm not calling anybody out. But the first time the man walked on the moon, the world was in awe. Beloved. This is the scene that we see in Jerusalem. But it was even greater. The whole city stopped that day to look at this man called Jesus. But the Bible goes on to say, who is this? Who is this? Now what does that mean? Who is this? After all the miracles that Jesus had performed, did they really not know who he was, did they really have to ask the question, who is this? Who is this doesn't mean that Jesus was not known. Hear me for just a minute. But who is this is all about, who is all this fuss about? Who is all this fuss about that's coming riding in on a colt? Who is this? Why are we so excited about it? Who is this? Remember they thought that nothing good could come out of Nazareth. 
The Bible tells us in John 1, 45 and 46, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, uh, Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, said, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathanael, can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Philip said. That's what we've done today. Invited you to come and see for yourself just how good King Jesus is. Because he'll never leave you, never forsake you. He'll never let you down. He'll never turn his back on you. He's not like your friends and your neighbors and even your relatives. He's always there for you. But Nathaniel's expression seems to indicate that he did not expect anything. Anything related to God's purpose could come from a place called Nazareth. Why? Because Nazareth ain't even mentioned in the Old Testament. The prophets never said the Messiah would come from Nazareth. They just knew he would come. And today, beloved, we still know that he's going to come. Look at your neighbor and say, do you know him? Look at your other one so they don't get jealous. I came here this morning to tell you that every eye will see him. Every eye will see him. Revelation 1-7 says, look, he is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Amen. Jesus' second coming will be visible. And it will be victorious. Everyone will see him arrive. And they will know that it is Jesus. When Christ returns, he will conquer evil and will judge all people according to their deeds. Even the men that pierced his side will see him face to face. Here's the thing, beloved. Not only will people see him, but people will have to acknowledge him. Philippians 2, 9 and 11 says, Therefore God elevated him to the place of the highest honor and gave him the name above all names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declares that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You got to understand something this morning. The Bible said every tongue in heaven, on earth and even under the earth. And they will recognize Jesus as Lord. Either because they believe on him or just because of the mere fact of undisputable faith. Facts that has been placed. Everyone will confess. No tongue will be silent when he comes back. No knee will remain unbowed when he comes back. All of creation will recognize that Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords. Even the hardest heart will have to bow and confess him. There's not, we have a lot of agnostics, we have a lot of atheists in the world, we got a lot of Muslims and, and Buddhists and all these other people and they can believe what they want and you can believe what you want this morning. But everyone that has ever denied him as Lord and Savior will have to acknowledge him. Everyone that has denied his existence, everyone that denied his deity, everyone that's denied his lordship, everyone that ever stood against the church, even Satan himself will bow before him. Him and acknowledge his lordship over all creation. When he comes a second time, there won't be nobody saying, who is this? They're all going to know. There is a difference, a somewhat significant difference between the first and the second coming. So my question this morning is, what are you doing to prepare yourself for the second coming? Because unless somebody's been in a time travel machine, none of us are there for his first coming. Unless he first entered your heart. So are you preparing your heart to meet him today? Are you preaching the word of God to others? Are you discipling others around you? Are you sharing the good news of Jesus Christ? Well, pastor, that's not my call. The Bible says in season and out of season. That's speaking to everybody. You always need to be having the good news of gospel of the gospel of Jesus Christ on your lips, beloved. It's not just in a church setting. It's not just within four walls. It's outside on the streets. I got to ask you this morning, are you ready? Look at your neighbor and say, are you ready? 
Definitely look at your next neighbor and tell him, are you ready? We got to be ready. I had a buddy of mine one time, and he, he, said, he said, Harold, do you really believe that, that if I'm laying on my deathbed that I can accept the Lord? I said, you sure can. If you are confessing with your, your mouth and believing in your heart and you're not doing a, a head confession, I said, you sure can. He said, well, Harold, why wouldn't I just wait to that day? And as we was riding down the road, I said, because no, there's no guarantee that a truck wouldn't hit his head on right now. You may not have that opportunity. Right. Beloved, don't play with the Lord because you may not have tomorrow. Today may be your last day. You might draw your last breath this morning. You could draw it right now in this service. But I'm telling you, you better be ready when he comes back for the second time. So let's look at something this morning. There's a little tiny piece of uh, ground near a small hill shaped as a skull outside the city walls of Jerusalem. Roman soldiers took and laid the Savior down on a cross and drove the nails through his hands and, and through his feet. Just a mere man named Jesus from Nazareth. After all, nothing comes out of Nazareth. But every time they, they took and they struck the nail, every time they, they, they swung another blow at it, it would echo all across the universe. And God sat on his throne and watched Jesus die this death, a painful death, a sinner's death. His only begotten son was executed by sinful men. Each one of us swung that hammer. Hold on, Pastor. I didn't kill Jesus. Yes, you did. Our sins put him on that cross. Our sins put him on that cross, beloved. You have to understand, every time you sin, you put him on that cross. Now, we know Jesus could have stopped it. He said he could call down a legion of angels. We know that God could have sat up there and done like that and it would have been over with in an instant. But instead, he allowed it. And why did he do it? Doesn't make sense, does it? But John 15, 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He didn't lay it down for his family. See, a lot of times we say, I can lay down my life for my family. No, for his friends, for his brother, for his sister. Hanging on the cross was a sinless man. He never knew sin. And he died for our sin. The just died for the unjust that might bring us back to God the Father. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Isaiah 53, 5 and 6 says that He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Do we really understand what he went through that day? As people went by and mocked him. Daring him to come down from the cross. If you are the son of God, come on down. And all Jesus could say is, I'm thirsty. As he hung on the cross and cried out that he was thirsty, and they brought him vinegar to drink. And at the same time, he hung on the cross and he cried out to the Father, and prayed for the very men that were doing this to him. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Beloved, the same thing he cried that day, he's crying for us today. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. 
we sin and don't really think about what we're doing, but I hope the next time sin enters your mind and your heart, you think about driving a nail through the Savior's hand and through His feet and taking the cross, the crown, and putting it upon His head. Every time you see it, you're doing it. As His mother would stand by and she had lost hope, as she sees her son brutally murdered, John loses all hope as he watches Jesus agonizes when he cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? His disciples run away and hide in a room in a city. They lose all hope as their plans for this great king that's going to come and liberate Israel. Uh, uh, Jesus seems like a bad dream all of a sudden. Darkness covers all the earth. The Bible says that the temple was ripped. The earth shook and the rocks split as Jesus cries out one last time, It's finished. He bows his head and takes his last breath. He's dead. All hope is now gone. One of the soldiers gets up one last time with the spear and shoves it into the Savior's side. As the blood and water come flowing out just to prove that he was dead. You stuck the spear in his side. They take his body down, bruised, bleeding, butchered, beyond recognition. Beyond recognition. And they have to place it in a tomb that they borrowed. The Bible says that the soldiers sealed the tomb up with a with a big rock and they post guards. The Jews put guards at the grave and one day's passed and nothing's happening and two days went by and, and everybody's in shock still. They, they can't even believe what really happened. Did he really die? Was it a bad dream? Was I thought he was our Savior. But nothing's happening. But praise God for the third day. Praise God for the third day. When the hope of all Israel and all humanity seemed to be completely shattered. All humanity has went back to the shackles and the chains of bondage of sin. But on the third day, early in that morning time, the first day of the week, hope began to stir just a little bit in the regions of the dead. Hope opened his eyes inside that tomb. Hope lifted his arms up and shifted his legs off the side of that place where he was laying. And he stood up and hope rose up that day and walked out of that tomb. I'm telling you today, he still lives today. He died for you, but he lives for you as well. It was hope that came out of that tomb that day. I came this morning to tell you there's still hope, beloved. It don't matter what the enemy tells you in your head. There's still hope. Jesus is our hope. And let me tell you, hope does a few things. It does not back up and it does not back down. We have hope in Jesus. He is our Savior. Hope don't bow out and hope don't cave in. It don't drop out and it don't run out. I got an overflow abundance of hope in my life because hope does not give in and hope does not give out. Hope does not give up. Up, beloved and we don't need to give up this morning either on our hope I know it seems like the world is going to hell in a handbasket but I got hope I got hope hope looks up where do I look to to the hills no I don't look to the hills I look to the heavens for where my hope is. 
Ah, hope stood up that morning and I could stand up every day knowing I got hope in him. Because hope measures up and hope buckles up. Hope soups up and hope shapes up. Hope warms up and rises up. Hope believes there's a sun even when it's cloudy outside and I can't see it. I know there's a sun. Hope is love. Even when I don't feel loved. Hope believes in God. Even when I can't hear them. Hope believes in them even when I can't see them. When I can't feel them. Hope is believing in something that only I can read about. But I got hope. You have to understand, beloved, hope sees the invisible when it isn't visible. Hope believes in the incredible and hope approaches the unapproachable. Hope bears the unbearable and hope endures the endurable. Where's your hope this morning? Because hope beats the unbeatable and hope defeats the undefeatable. Hope says do what you want, but I'm not moving because I got hope. Hope says you can throw everything you have at me, including the kitchen sink, but I'm not going to shake. I'm not going to move because I'm like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I shall not be moved because I got hope. How many of you got hope this morning? Somebody shout hope. Now look at your neighbor and say, you got it. Yes. Now look at your other one and say, you got it. Yes. Say, I got it. I got hope in Jesus this morning. Hallelujah. Hope does something for us, beloved. Hope gives us a greater level of hope. Hope builds our faith up to a new level. You got to understand, hope is a lame man on his way to see Jesus. And he turns around and he tells his friends, when I come back, we're going to go for a little walk. And a matter of fact, we might go for a run and a swim. That's where my hope is. I'm going to see hope this morning. Some of you came here today without any hope. But I came to tell you, you got hope this morning. Because hope is the blind man going to meet Jesus. And he turns around and tells his mama, he said, I've always heard your voice. And it's beautiful. When I come back, I'm going to see your face this time. I'm going to see the glory of the Lord on you. That's my hope this morning. Ah, hope is the mute, deaf man that's going to meet Jesus. He gives a little sign language to those that knows it and says, when I come back, we're going to carry on a conversation. We're going to have a talk. I'm going to see hope. I don't know about you. But every morning I wake up with hope. All throughout scripture, we find stories of hope. But the greatest one is found in Matthew 28 and 6. It says, he isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Just as he said it would happen. Come see where his body was lying. I'm telling you right now, you should be shouting that your God is not still in a tomb somewhere. You ought to be shouting that when they rolled that stone back and they walked in there and they saw there was nothing laying there, only the garments of a man's body and a napkin oh, that was folded up. And was sitting there where his head lay. Be representing. I ain't finished yet. I ain't finished yet. If he'd have been finished, it would have been crinkled up and thrown down. But he folded it up and said, I ain't finished yet. Hope is still alive. Hope is still alive. Where does your hope lie this morning? Mine lies in Jesus. Many things talk about hope. But it was the first resurrection morning that hope busted out of a prisoner's death. A prison cell made for death, he came out of it. He went down into hell and took back the keys. He proved once and for all that he is our true hope. And he is the only hope. Come on up, Pastor Jennifer. Ephesians 4, 4 says, There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. 
He is the hope of all humanity. He is the merciful hope. Psalms 33, 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. Psalm 147, 11 says, The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. He is the God of hope. He's the hope that gives gladness. Proverbs 10, 28. The hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. He's a hope. He's a hope that will not shame us. Psalm 119, 116. Uphold me according unto thy word that I may live and let me not be ashamed of my hope. He's a rejoicing hope. Psalm 16, 9. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also rests in hope. He is the righteous hope. He is the hope of the righteous that gives gladness. Proverbs 10, 28. The hope of righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of wicked shall perish. Look who he is this morning. He's our hope. He's the word of hope. 1981. My soul fainteth. My soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. He's the hope we can believe in. Romans 4:18. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. He's our secured hope. Job eleven eighteen, and thou shalt be secure because there is hope. Thou shalt dig about thee and thou shalt take thy rest in safety. He's our trustworthy hope. Psalm 71, 5. For thou art my hope, O Lord God. Thou art my trust from my youth. He's our quiet hope. Lamentations 3.26 It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. He's our continuous hope. Psalm 71.14 But I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. He's our hope in the day of evil. Jeremiah 17.17 17, Be not a terror unto me. Thou art my hope in the day of evil. He's our door of hope, Hosea 2.15, and I will give her her vineyards from thence in the valley of Accor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. He's our loving hope, Romans 5.5. 5. And hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. He's our resurrected hope. Acts 23, 6. I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called. He's an anchor in hope. Hebrews 6, 18 and 19. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast and which entereth into that within the veil he's an assuring hope Hebrews 6 11 and we desire that every one of you do shew the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end he's the best hope this morning Hebrews 7 19 for the law made nothing perfect but the bringing in of a better hope did by which we draw nigh unto God He's the blessed hope. Titus 2.13 Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the earnest hope. Philippians 1.20 and 21 According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed but that with all boldness as always so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body whether it be life or by death. For to live is Christ and to die is Gain. Beloved, he's your eternal hope this morning. Titus 3 7, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. He's the hope even in death. Proverbs 14 32, the wicked is driven away in his wickedness, but the righteous have hope in his death. He's a firm hope, Hebrews 3, 6. But Christ is a son over his own house. Whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? He's a good hope. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which have loved us and have given us everlasting consolation and good hope. 
through grace. You didn't know he was so many hopes, did you? He's your glorious hope. Colossians 1.27 To whom God we would make known what is the riches of the glory, this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's our grounded hope. Colossians 1.23 If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister your lively hope today. 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Some of you have been running for a long time. Praise God, He's a patient hope. Romans 8, 25, But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. And when that day comes, he's going to be a rejoicing hope. Romans 12, 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. He's my purifying hope, 1 John 3, 3. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. He's a reasoned hope, 1 Peter 3, 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man. That asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And lastly today, he's your saving hope. First Thessalonians 5, 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love before a helmet, the hope of salvation. He died so that you and I could be saved. He gave the ultimate sacrifice for you. Not just for me, but for you. Paid that price. And because of that, He lives today. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. You know, oftentimes we think about time travel, or I do anyway. And I always think about going back and doing this and doing that. But I can only imagine running to that tomb that day. And looking in and seeing and shouting, He's alive. How do I know he lives today? Because he lives within me. How do I know he lives today? Because I was a dead man walking. That's how I know he lives. And as long as he's living inside of you today, you have hope in everything that I just read. But if you don't, you have no hope. But the good news is, don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Because he hasn't given up on you. If he'd have gave up on you, beloved, you wouldn't be here this morning. But somehow he got you here today. And today needs to be the day that you look at that devil square in the eye. And say, devil, I'm no longer serving you. But I got hope today. Because Jesus Christ lives inside of me. That's my prayer today. Is that no one would leave this place not knowing him as their Lord and Savior. Beloved, all I can do is lead you the way. It's up to you to take the steps. My granddaddy used to always say, you can lead the horse to the water, but you can't make him drink. You've been led here this morning by the Spirit of God. 
you've been laid out the Word of God. Manna from heaven. But nobody can force feed you. It's up to you to eat on what God's prepared before you. Bow your heads for just a minute. Father, today, Lord, You knew the outcome before it ever happens. You knew who would be here this morning. You knew who would. And I thank you, Lord, that we're able to come in here and have good worship music. Have an illustration of dancing for you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for all these things. But Lord, if you don't get glory out of it, they mean nothing. It's all about you, Lord. Today, there's many in this room that have prayed and fasted for people in this room. There are people that have prayed and fasted for those they didn't even know were going to be here today. God, you made a way. today, Lord, I pray that your word has fallen on the hearts of hungry people. I pray that your, your word has went forth as the word of God says, is sharper than a two-edged sword. I pray today, Father, that I added nothing to it and took nothing away from it, but spoke it as you would had me to speak it. You provided over 2,000 years ago, Lord, for us. You still provide today for those who trust in you. For those who hope lies in you. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you right now, sweep through this room. Let every heart be checked this morning. Every intention, every thought, let it be put under captive to you, Lord. This morning we're getting ready to prepare for communion. you're here today and you don't know the Lord maybe you've walked away from him done some things you didn't need to do but you realize this morning just what he did for you beloved now is your opportunity to make it right with the only one that matters Understand when I say the person beside you will not matter when you pass away. The person in front of you or behind you will not matter. The only one that's going to matter is Jesus. And if you had a relationship with him, not a one night stand, but a relationship, a marriage, a commitment. That's you today. You say, Pastor, I need that. I need that in my life. I'm tired of running from them. I'm tired of riding the fence. I'm ready to dig my heels in, be a part of the Lord's army. I never realized exactly what He done for me until you laid it out this morning by the Spirit of God. And it has touched my heart in such a way that I want to give my heart back to the one that gave His for me. you this morning. I'm going to count to three and I want you to just simply lift your hand. You will either acknowledge him now or you will acknowledge him when he comes again. But the second time, beloved, you won't have the opportunity to acknowledge him like you do now. 
the second time will be a time of judgment. Today's the day for salvation. Today's the day. Don't gamble with the time clock. Because nobody knows the hour but God the Father. If you're here this morning, you say, ask me, Pastor, I need them. I need to repent of my sins. I need them in my life. I need to rededicate my life to them. If that's you this morning, I'm going to count three. Just simply lift your hand. One, two, three, lift your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Is anybody else in this place? I see your hand. Anybody else in this place? Hallelujah. Amen. This morning we're going to pray and believe for life change. And beloved, you need life change this morning. You don't need just a prayer. You need life change. And I can't give it to you. But I know the one that can. All right. Hey, Pastor Harold here again. Uh, coming to you live. I want to say thank you for watching that message. I pray and believe that it has changed your life for Jesus Christ. And so today, if you made a commitment to serve the Lord, maybe for the first time, or maybe you was rededicating your life to the Lord, we want to know about it right here at Abundant Life for Sight. You can hit us up on our Facebook page by Messenger. And just simply type, let us know that you uh, made that decision today because we want to get in contact with you and let you know what your next step is as a child of God. We also want to encourage you to find a church home. We believe your church home is right here. God has led you to watch uh, our sermon today, our messages, and we believe that he has drawn you to this house. And so we would like to hear from you. We'd like to see you here at our services at one of uh, Sundays 9 or 11 a.m. We also have Wednesday night service at 7 p.m. with complete youth ministry, children's ministry, the whole nine yards. Hey, we want to see and hear from you. Also, I want to just simply touch base. A lot of people ask us how they can sow into this ministry. Well, there's several ways that you can do it. Number one, you can mail it to 962 Juliet Road, Forsyth, Georgia, 31029. You can also download our app. Our app is called Abundant Life Church, Georgia. You can find that either in iTunes or on Google Play. It's a free app. Download it. You can go on there and click on the Forsyth campus, give to Forsyth. You can give that way. You can also give through our online website. Now, that I'll have to get you a little bit more information on. But if you would like to send a prayer request, you can also send a prayer request uh, through email to ForsythInfo at AbundantLifeChurch.com. The last thing, you can always contact us by phone, and we can give you any information you need. Our phone number is uh, 470 369 7300. Hey, I pray and believe that God has touched you today, and I want to hear from you. Hey, stay tuned. We got a lot of messages coming your way. God bless you and have a great day.